May God's words alone be spoken. May God's words alone be heard. Amen. Amen. There's a practice in the AA program that says someone new to sobriety should attend 90 meetings in 90 consecutive days. The belief is that you have to do something 90 times for it to become a habit. Well, this church has celebrated Memorial Day for the last nine years, and it has not become a habit, but rather our tradition. On this day, St. James stops to look back into our church history and to memorialize seven young men from this congregation who all died in World War I. Their actions, along with all the others who had died in wars, changed the course of the world. Memorial Day is that national moment when we celebrate the unofficial beginning of summer. Look around. Right. It's also our turn to pay attention and remember and reminisce about all those who died in war. On this weekend, we recall their stories of courage. We raise flags in their honor. We turn out our scout troops and we have school bands parade through the towns in honor of those in the military who gave up everything so that we may be free. It gladdens my heart that this national observance should fall on another significant Sunday, the Feast of Pentecost. Like Memorial Day, Pentecost also calls us to remember particularly what we committed to as followers of Jesus. It's a remarkable event that transformed a gaggle of disciples into an emerging and eternal church. Pentecost is that moment that changed everything. Now, I know that over the years you've picked up a lot of strange information about Pentecost. It's the birthday of the church. It celebrates the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the origin of a lot of quaint Christian customs, some of which are pretty odd. One of the oddest, I think, is that the origin of Pentecost is reflected in the bishop's hat. Those points on the bishop's hat are to represent the tongues of fire. I know this because when she's here, it's my job to make sure she doesn't sit on her hat. So this day of Pentecost is full of strange stuff, but it is worth remembering because at its core, it is a timeless spiritual truth. The story is this, one day in Jerusalem, Jesus' friends a group of scared and dispirited folk are gathered to reflect on the meaning of their friend's life when something really scary happens. They feel the room fill with a gale force wind and sense that they themselves are on fire. And that's just the beginning. Next, they start to talk amongst themselves and the visitors from all over the world start to pour into the street because they are understanding what the disciples are saying. Now to the writer who recorded this event about 125 years after it happened, there could have been only one precedent for him or her. The story of the Tower of Babel, in which just the reverse took place. In that story, early humans all speak one language and civilization grows by leaps and bounds. But then people get so power hungry and greedy that they start to build a tower tall enough to reach heaven or at least to feel like they've done something so powerful and important that they could claim to be like God. You want to annoy God? Go ahead and do that. So God gets hunk on them, as my grandmother would say, and God creates a bunch of languages. So now the tower builders can't communicate with each other. They've truly become a people of Babel because they are babbling. Unable to communicate and cooperate, they couldn't finish the tower. God had put humankind back in its place, and to this day, we continue to be separated by our languages. Whatever the exact details of Pentecost, and you need to know that a lot of the details get muddied when you're telling a story that's over 100 years old, the writer wanted us to know this. When human beings are in the grips of the spirit of the living God, the confusion of the Tower of Babel is reversed. People with different backgrounds, customs, appearances, and languages begin to understand each other. In other words, one of the unmistak unmistakable signs of the presence of God in the world is that barriers between people fall down. People reach out beyond themselves and beyond their own comfort zones. The family of God gets bigger, and each person grows more open and more accepting. 
When this happens, humankind can accomplish a lot more than we ever could alone. How else will we ever achieve world peace? I hope we don't look back on an event like Pentecost only with nostalgia. I think it is important for us to celebrate the great days of the liturgical year because they are watershed moments that help us develop deeper and richer souls. They tell us to look for those events in our own hearts and minds and to follow them where they lead. Of all the things we might remember about the Feast of Pentecost, I cling to this. This feast is a guidepost in the journey of our souls. It is a point that calls us to attention and then action. This strange and wonderful moment of wind and fire is a sacred marker pointing the way for us forward. Today, as I ponder the intersection of Memorial Day and Pentecost, the story of young men experiencing a Pentecost moment that changed the course of their lives is on my mind. It reminds me of one familiar book that was all about a Pentecost moment. It is a work of fiction that has many flaws and many controversies. But at the time it was written, it made a powerful commentary about slavery and segregation in this country. You all know it, it's Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. It was published in 1884, and it tells the story of Huck escaping from poverty and abuse on a raft tri trip with Jim. Jim's an escaped slave. They've taken care of each other for weeks, but then Huck has to choose between his friendship and the moral and legal dictates of America in the 1850s. Huckleberry is presented with a watershed moment in which he must give Jim away to the slave hunting legal authorities. It has been made clear to him that if he does not do this, he'll be in big trouble. It is his legal duty to turn over that slave and also his religious obligation because it is a sin to help a slave escape. It's a great moment in American literature as Huck examines his option to become an outlaw and worse, a sinner condemned to damnation or to give his friend away. Huck decides, all right then, I'll go to hell. In that decision, Huck, the child of the American South who created him, grew into a more open and more godly human being. In that story, the Holy Spirit was loose in the world as she always is, making people uncomfortable and breaking down barriers. You know all about that. I'm grateful to you, St. James, for also living in that same holy discomfort. You proclaim it each Sunday in your colic for the community. Like Huck, you wrestle with those Pentecost moments when the Holy Spirit guides you into the discomfort of deciding what is wrong and what is right and true. And no matter how uncomfortable and challenging it may be, this church always makes a sanctuary where everyone is welcome. Those seven boys we're honoring in our church tower, they'd be proud of you this morning. So today, it isn't just about remembering how all this church stuff started. Pentecost is also a perpetual call to action as God's people. Uniting us in one language of peace and love, God makes it clear that what we speak must become how we are to live. The Holy Spirit that descends from heaven in tongues of fire is a restless being, breeding action over ambivalence and selfishness. That spirit turns us out into the world to always be looking forward, seeking to bring God's message into the world by our actions. That first Pentecost is a moment living in our rear view mirror that should remain there as we pick up where Jesus left off. In John's gospel, Jesus is spending the last days on earth, and he couldn't be more clear about what the disciples are to do in the spirit of the Holy Spirit. He tells them, peace be with you. And then he shows them his hands and his side. Peace be with you, he says, and as the Father has sent me, so I send you. He then breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That is Jesus' call to action for those disciples. Get out of your seats. Get out of this room. Go and do the right thing for God's people. It's the same call for us today and every day. 
Jesus sends us out in the winds of the Holy Spirit. We're blown out of the comfort of our pews. We're tasked with bringing love and peace to all our neighbors, no matter who they may be. And that's where Memorial Day and Pentecost bump heads. One sits in the reverie of the past, while the other is all about how we manage our present and future by taking action in community. The thing about a Memorial Day is that it is stuck in time. It doesn't look forward, but dwells on events and beloved individuals from our past, things done that cannot be undone. Our magnificent bell tower is a monument to the past and those killed in World War I. It was called the Great War, and when that tower was dedicated over 100 years ago, it was believed that there would never, ever be such a war again. Many years later, many wars later, we've learned that peace is transient. Despite all the monuments and the memorials and the parades dedicated to the dead, those gestures are no challenge or match for the bully that is war. On every memorial, there is always space available for one more war, one more name. George Butcher's letter demands that we take our sacred responsibility to remember seven young men who sat right here in this sanctuary. This was their church. Montclair was their home. Montclair High School was their high school and their lives were surrounded with parents and grandparents and siblings and sweethearts, all to be left behind. These young men were full of life and dreams and hopes to come. That never happened. They had their Pentecost moment and they answered the call, stepping forward for something greater than themselves, the peace and sanctity of the world. They died in a strange land some of them buried in foreign soil forever. So today, we pray for those seven young men of Montclair with gratitude and with love. We remember George Butcher, Everett Moore, Howard Cook, Maurice Niven, Louis Finstag, Chapin Barr, and Richard Rose. In calling their names, we honor their memory and we embrace the Holy Spirit of Pentecost that touched their hearts and call them to action for the sake of others. They were called into a war that would steal their lives, and yet they went. My promise to them is this. As long as our tower stands, as long as this church gathers in God's name, we will always remember you. And because we too are a people of the Holy Spirit, like Huckleberry Finn, we are willing to risk a trip to hell if it means taking the right action to stand on the right side of right for those who need us most. Amen. <laughs>